All right, again, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I greet you in the greetings and salutations of peace as taught to our blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the giver of peace, by the bestower of peace, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, today, we are uh, so excited for continuing our Inside Islam series uh, with a very special special session today on uh, Daudi Bora Islam. Um, and uh, we have a really opportun great opportunity to talk with our brother, uh, brother Murtaza Rawat, and uh, be able to learn uh, a little bit more. But the essence of what Inside Islam is as a monthly interfaith series is that uh, as uh, a community, as Muslims in general, um, we often encounter this aspect of interfaith quite a bit, uh, interacting with different religions within uh, America, within our society, uh, being 1% of the U.S. population, you know, that'll tend to happen, that we'll encounter people who are very different than us and from, uh, from different religions. But uh, here at Muslim Space, we recognize the need to also uh, address uh, the aspect of intrafaith. Uh, because there's oftentimes significant misunderstandings between uh, different communities, different types of Muslims that lead to pretty catastrophic results um, that have uh, unfortunately taken a turn for the worse when those differences are uh, not understood and people uh, kind of act on uh, ignorance as opposed to getting to know one another and getting to know uh, the other person, especially as another Muslim. And so the focus of this series, inshallah, is to lift up specifically uh, communities of belief, different uh, communities within Islam that have been traditionally misunderstood. Um, you can say minority faith uh, communities, you can say sects, you can say denominations, you can say any, any type of term you'd like, um, but at the essence, uh, communities that have been unfortunately misunderstood and oftentimes on the margins. Uh, when we talk about Islam or when we say Islam, we may not be thinking about some of these communities or um, these other Muslims as well. And so we want to be mindful of that. And so inshallah, what we hope uh, to accomplish with this series is to be able to provide a platform where the perspective that is shared, um, the perspective about these communities that's shared comes from someone within the community. Because so often than not, we'll probably have presentations where somebody else will try to explain about another person's Islam or another person's community and doesn't do it justice at all. So we want to make sure we adhere to the authenticity of this by giving that platform, of course, to someone from this community, but then also allowing folks who are here uh, in the space to be able to then uh, interact and ask questions. So uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to Brother Murtaza. And before I do so, uh, if you have any questions, like I said, uh, inshallah, towards the end of the session, we'll have some time to do some question answer. Uh, please feel free to drop any questions that you have into the chat. You can message me directly um, and you can uh, just put it there. But please uh, just be mindful of this. We, we want to keep the chat, keep the space with the utmost respect uh, that we carry each and every one of our events for, and especially uh, events that are lifting up our differences and, and, and lifting up our shared kind of values that we have here and uh, the underlying respect that we try to uphold with this. So without further ado, Brother Murtaza, I would like to go ahead and have you uh, kick us off here, inshallah. Jazakallah for being here and look forward to the presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everybody. Uh, thank you, Chaplain Osama. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today and share a little bit about the Dawud Boras. I myself, um, I live in Austin, like I believe many of you as well, and uh, part of the Dawud Bora community here. I serve in the role of uh, on the board of directors, have the opportunity to give back to the community and help shape the future of our kids as well. Um, Today is part of the opportunity here to talk about Dawud Boras. I'll spend a little bit of time to talking about our origins, kind of helping distinguish us from, as uh, Chaplain Sama mentioned earlier, uh, the different sects that we've had in Islam uh, to kind of show what is our heritage and what's our lineage. And then also what our core beliefs, talk a little bit about our culture, who we are, you know, as you see it more from the outwardly perspective, some versatile contributions, uh, talk a little bit about misconceptions, and then our Austin Jamaat, our Austin community, I'll just share a little bit about for those that also belong to uh, the city of Austin here. To get going, uh, we'll jump into origins right away. So the Dawdi Bora community, uh, you know, I think we are best probably known as having inherited a very distinguished heritage of the Fatimid Imams, right? So we identify as the Shia, Fatimi, Smiley, Taibi, 
uh, from the different lineages that have happened. I'm sure you've heard from others as well. And I've had the opportunity to listen in. I think it was a really rich discussion that has been had for the last few sessions. Um, we obviously believe in the direct descendants of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, and through Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, uh, who married Muhammad Fatima, the daughter of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Imams that came from that lineage through Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, and then the sons of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Uh, those Imams, as uh, kind of mentioned, as you can imagine, started off in Medina, then held uh, various posts in North Africa, eventually establishing an empire there, uh, and then uh, establishing Cairo as the seat in Egypt. Um, the seclusion of the 21st Imam, which is Imam al Qayyib, uh, we, at that time, the Dawat moved to Yemen. So while the Imamate continues, through father to son of the descendants of Imam Tayyib, uh, the Duat Mutlaqeen were established, or Al Dail Mutlaq, and I'll speak a little bit about that in a second. And they were established in Yemen. Uh, there was a kingdom in Yemen, uh, and then as part of that, the Duats have continued that heritage of, uh, you know, bringing everyone together and teaching about Islam and leading everyone back to Allah Taala. Subhanahu wa Taala. All right, um, later after Yemen, so we fast forward about 450 years in that process, uh, the Dawat moved to India. So there was a sizable community all the way back uh, to the times of the Imams in, in Cairo, in Misr, in Egypt, uh, in, in India. And then at the time when the Da'is, uh, yes, that was the best move, uh, the seat of the office of al Dail Mutlaq moved to India. So the followers remained in Yemen and in India and elsewhere but the seat of the Dawat was in India and that was the headquarters. The current Dail Mutlaq, uh, uh, His Holiness, Dr. Sayyid Mufalu Saifuddin, were his ardent followers. Uh, you know, His Holiness, we referred to him as Mola, as uh, you know, someone beloved and someone who we look up to. He acts as our guide, he's our mentor, and we also treat him as the final interpretant of religion uh, through the authority given to him by the Imams. Uh, a little bit about the Dawa Dibora term. So just stepping back in time, as we talked about the various sects that have happened over time, um, our 27th Dawa Mutlaq was Sayyidina Dawa bin Qutub Shah. And there was a contest, uh, contesting of the leadership at that time. So this was during uh, the Mughal Empire time. And basically uh, the followers of Sayyidina Dawood became called Dawoodi. And then Bora, as a Gujarati word, means traders and businessmen. Um, today, we're settled in over 40 countries uh, across the globe. We have about 1 million members of the faith. And uh, this image here kind of does a little bit of justice to capturing you know, the number of families and the number of followers as part of that in the various regions all over around the world. Obviously, the, uh, we're focused in a lot of the, uh, our community members live in India in Pakistan, the Middle East, uh, in East Africa, but over the last several decades have also moved over to Europe, North America, and Australia as well. So we'll talk a little bit about the core beliefs. So uh, just like any and all Muslims here gathered today, uh, you know, we believe in the one deity, Allah Ta'ala Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And we believe in the Holy Quran as the scripture and the word of Allah. Um, and we believe in the sacred mission of the prophets and their successors. So we adhere to the teachings of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi And, you know, one, and this might come back up on the misconception side, but one of the things that often bring, uh, comes up when talking about Shias versus Sunni Islam is sometimes on, you know, what are the beliefs? So one of our Da'il uh, Mutlaq, uh, Sayyidina Qutb, Qutbuddin al-Shaheed had mentioned that we are true Sunnis. We're the faithful followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi sunnah. So while we are referred to as Shias, you know, we do believe ourselves in many sense to be Sunnis and also followers of the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi. Um, obviously, as we talked about on the uh, on the origin side, in terms of the heritage, we recognize Mu'an Ali alayhi salam or Imam Ali also is referred by the Shias as a true successor of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Imams thereafter that descended from Fatima alayhi salam and uh, Mawlana Ali and the sons of Imam Hussein. 
the Dawoodi Boras, we, uh, you know, we follow the Fatimi Smiley Taibi school of thought. Um, you know, what that really means is we believe in the worship of Allah for salvation uh, in the hereafter by following the pillars of Islam, adhering to the religious practices ordained by uh, Sharia, including reciting Quran, the five daily prayers, fasting during the month of Ramadan. An integral part of our faith is that um, an imam descended from the prophet through his grandson, as we talked about him saying, always exists on earth to continue the mission of guiding mankind. So uh, son succeeding after the father, the imam, like the prophet, it is believed to be sinless, inerrant, immaculate, and sacred, and the repository of prophetic knowledge and the final interpreter of religion. So that's a key aspect of uh, our belief. Another important part, uh, you know, ties back to the hadith of Rasulullah is Muslim which means, you know, we're all required, it's obligatory on us to seek knowledge. So you'll find Daudi Bora's uh, very much to be well-educated throughout the world. Um, as we talked about also the term Bora being traders, we're also professionals uh, in many different fields. Um, at the same time, that also means seeking knowledge within Islam. So Quran al Karim being, you know, the word of God. We're all, you know, students of Al Quran uh, and the various sacred te texts written by the various Imams and Dais thereafter. Um, and that, that leads to the guidance and teachings that we follow from the Imam and the Wat Mutakin as well. Uh, I would say a key factor in all of this, you know, if we were to synthesize it down, is believing in peace, love, and humanity. So, you know, as part of the series here, which I think is amazing, we also love to have interfaith and intrafaith dialogue to make sure that we're, uh, you know, better understood and understand each other much better. One thing that kind of uh, probably stands out uh, about us uh, and similar to other Shias as well as uh, the belief in Imam Hussein al -Islam, and you know uh, the remembrance of the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. So Ashura Mubaraka, which you know literally uh, is translated to the Blessed Ten, is a period of ten days where you know well throughout the year we're focused on you know the learnings of Islam and you know uh, going back and focusing on Islam. We really dedicate these ten days to doing very much that. So we attend sermons, uh, you know, uh, we remember obviously the tragedy of Karbala and the plight of Imam Hussein while talking about Islam, justice, truth, humanity, and the various teachings of Islam. Um, another kind of, you know, tying back to the concept of seeking knowledge, uh, uh, you know, there's a rich tradition, a lot of amazing texts from our dialogue mutlaqs uh, over the years that, you know, we recite, we learn from, we focus on and introspect on. Um, and the picture here actually is our 51st diamond with like Sinatar Sefuddin. He was a renowned scholar, uh, has written many, you know, poems, many books. Uh, and as part of that, uh, you know, today we all attend various, uh, you know, teaching sessions of teachings of Quran and various texts. And there's a gathering that happens throughout the year now called Al Istifad al Ilmiya, uh, which, you know, follows that same tradition of learning. Another important aspect, uh, you know, I would say is part of our core beliefs. You know, we, we all live here in the United States and in foreign lands is So regardless of where you live, you know, as, as Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi has said, the love's, love for one's country is an integral part of the faith. So that's important in how we give back to the society and how we interact with the society that we're part of and where our kids are growing up and where we're earning our living. All right, so I'll switch over a little bit now to culture. Uh, so the Dawoodi Bora culture, you know, uh, I would say a key aspect of that, you'll see it in our architecture. Uh, and a lot of the mosques that were built during the Fatimid eras and the Mount mosques that were built over the last, you know, 900 years, but especially the last 100, 200 years, you'll see a very distinct architecture that derives from the Fatimid era. Um, I would say it's, it, it very much imbibes the culture. For example, just kind of diving in, to the architecture that you see here, um, very much in congruence with Islamic architecture overall, but you'll see the use of the Kufi cut of uh, Arabic, for example, you know, that ties back a lot to the Fatimid era. 
And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just very much a part of our everyday life and everything that we, uh, you know, interact with on a daily basis. Another very important aspect is the language we speak. Um, you know, we call it the Lisan of Dawa or Lisan of Dawat. Uh, it combines elements of Arabic, Persian, Urdu, and Gujarati. The syntax uh, is on the Gujarati language, but the script it would be Arabic. <clears throat> or you can even you know, say Urdu because obviously they're similar from a text perspective. Um, Arabic continues to be our kind of like lingua franca for religious scholarship and literature. So a lot of the books and the texts that I talked about earlier are written in Arabic by our scholars, by our duat, by the imams and the duats during their times. Um, but the sound of Dawud is what's used for sermons as well as various discourses. Um, and, you know, it's truly important to us, and you'll see this a lot when we're speaking to our kids, speaking to our family, and obviously in our sermons, is we really believe that the Lisan of Dawah, the use of that, preserves the cultural and spiritual roots, while also, you know, uh, evolving to the current needs of the age. Uh, something that's very special to us all, food, right? <laughs> uh, the Dawah Dibora food is a very specific culinary heritage as well. So what you see here, uh, I'll talk more about the tradition first, then we can talk a little bit about the food sometime. And I want to invite you all to come join us for food sometime at our at our mosque, uh, at our markas in, in Pflugerville and here in Austin and any of the communities that you may be listening from. Uh, as we talked about earlier, we were living in many different places. Um, is the sitting together. We, we sit together for meals, uh, you know, in, in, in groups of eight or nine. Obviously, it can be less or more, but typically that. And all the food is kind of shared, right? So there's communal eating, as you will see in other ways, but we sit around a metal plate, you know, talk about life, share stories. Obviously, talk of religion comes, but also just ability to share and get to know each other a little bit better. Um, so it's just a very special kind of uh, part of our culture. And uh, you'll see that when you look up Dal Dibora traditions, Dal Dibora food. And a lot of our food, you know, obviously descending from the Indian heritage of the last, uh, a lot of our food will be very similar to that, but some cuisines are actually very specific to Dal Dibora's. Uh, again, we invite you all to please join us sometime. We'd love to share a meal with you. Uh, something else that you'll kind of find very specific about us is the libas, the clothing that we wear. We call it libas al anwar. Um, so for men, uh, as I'm wearing today, or you'll see in the pictures here, you'll notice it's kind of a garb of white. And it's actually a three-piece suit between the pants or pajamas um, and then an inside kurta and a saya on top. Uh, we also wear a skull cap or a topi, as you'll know in, uh, in Urdu or Hindi. Um, and typically, you know, it's either the variety where it's based in white with, you know, orange embroidery. Uh, and depending on that, can be one of these are the ones that you see here. Uh, for the women, uh, they'll be wearing a garb uh, similar to a burqa, but we call it a rida. Uh, and a rida is a two-piece, you know, a bottom and a top uh, to preserve the Islamic heritage there as well. And the kids will dress similarly. And as you can kind of notice, and you'll notice in a lot of the women that have joined here today, as well as as you meet them, uh, the rida can be pretty colorful. It's a way to kind of express your own uh, individuality while preserving, uh, obviously, our own privacy. All right, so jumping a little bit now to the societal contributions. Uh, I'll focus a little bit more on the last 100 years or so. Uh, obviously, if we were set back in time, from the time of Rasulullah, from the time of Muhammad Ali, from the Imams, there's tons of societal contributions from the Fatimid eras in Egypt uh, for then on. But I'll, I'll be kind of focusing more on the last 50 to 100 years. Um, I would say kind of our, as I kind of mentioned from a, you know, culture's aspect, architecture is a big aspect to us. And some of it probably drives from the focus on revival and renovations of the mosques uh, during the times of the Fatimid era. Um, and this one that you're seeing here is the Jamil Anwar. It's uh, based in, uh, in Cairo, in Misr. Uh, it's also known as uh, Al Jamil Al Hakim Al Amr Allah, who was an Imam. Um, and it, it's, I mean, just want to see the beauty of this mosque, uh, you know, as a lot of the other grand mosques, it just, you know, puts you in a different state of mind as well. And uh, it's, it's been a focus in a lot of the mosques in Cairo, uh, in, in North Africa, in various parts of the Middle East, and then India and Pakistan also have been revived. And the newer mosques that have been built, uh, let's see, where, yeah, 
and then the construction of various mosques, universities, and schools, <clears throat> especially the last hundred years, has been uh, kind of on the same tradition, right? So a lot of the a lot of the architecture that you'll see as part of the constructions that happen will embed that Fatimi architecture within it. Um, so to the left here, you see is actually this was just inaugurated in Mumbai. It's a uh, it's a university. Uh, we call it uh, Jamia Tusafia. It has four campuses worldwide, one in Surat in India, one in Mumbai in India, in Karachi, Pakistan, and Norob in Nairobi in Africa. Um, and, and as part of the scholars that come out of that are those that are really leading the various communities and providing the religious teachings to all of us as followers. Um, you'll also see various mosques. The one that you see pictured here is actually out in Houston. So if you're ever in Houston, the Katy area, you probably swing by and it, it's a beautiful mosque and a lot of our mosques throughout um, will have a similar take on it. A lot of mothers says a lot of schools have also been built, obviously, for the teachings of our of our young children. And uh, soon, I'll, inshallah, when we talk about Austin, I'll talk about the mosque we're looking to build here as well. Another, uh, you know, key, I would say, <clears throat> feature that you'll hear about often um, of Dalvi Boras is a community kitchen system that's been set up. So it, we call it the Faidul Mawaid al uh, which is, it's it's inspired by the 52nd Dayal Mutlaq, Sayyidina Muhammad Burhanuddin and, you know, his, uh, and those that preceded him, uh, and Sayyidina Muhammad Sayyidin, our leader today, has really brought it to a worldwide scale, where all the communities, all our communities worldwide, that we talked about um, pretty much receive food on a daily basis. So whether you're getting five or six meals throughout the week, the idea behind this is that there should be no one who sleeps hungry, right? As part of that concept, uh, you know, it's the same meal that everyone, regardless of societal status, regardless of you know who you are, receives. Um, and we we take that pretty seriously. We have a whole system set up, and then we use that as an opportunity to give back. So what you see on the right here today on the bottom is, I believe, uh, some of the floods that happened in India during one of the monsoon seasons. Uh, but also I can talk about in the U.S. during the various uh, storms that we've had, various hurricanes, uh, you know, in the Northeast, whether it be in down here in Texas. We've used this opportunity to give back to the community and make sure that, you know, everyone has access to food. <laughs> Another... Um, Aspect is Qardin Hasana, which is mentioned several times in the Quran. Uh, it's basically an interest-free loan. So we make interest-free loans available to our community members to, you know, whether they're buying a house, want to spend on education, uh, want to start a business, there's medical expenses or other needs. We make sure that those are all kind of met. Um, and, you know, as, as any financial system, there's strict rigor around it to make sure it's successful. But, uh, you know, we want to make sure that those in need have access to funds without having to go into interest. Um, another key kind of feature is upliftment, upliftment of those around. Uh, what you're picturing here is the Safi Burhani Upliftment Trust. So if you've ever been to Mumbai in India, uh, or if you know about Pindi Bazaar, it looks nothing like this picture. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very old town, uh, you know, uh, old grotto, a lot of really decapitated buildings, dilapidated buildings. Um, and Basically, there was the vision of our 52nd Dayal Mutlaq to revive that and bring it to where everyone has decent living, to make sure they all have personal bathrooms, um, have privacy in their homes. So as part of that process, uh, this is something that he's envisioned. A lot of these buildings have started coming up, so it's really exciting. It's taken some time over the last decade to make sure that everything is in process and working with the government, uh, the local government and the government of India, making sure that this project is a success. So. Uh, something that we're all really looking forward to. But really what it really imbibes is the, I would say if we were to step above this, the real kind of message behind it is that everyone should have a roof over their head. So we make sure that, you know, all our community members and others also have that opportunity. So through an uplifting process, we'll have folks that go out to various parts of India, Pakistan, Yemen, Africa, or anywhere else uh, throughout the world and just make sure that, again, if anyone is in need, their needs are being met. And this is uh, a lot of what I just talked about can be summarized down to Project RISE. So it's a Project RISE, the philanthropic arm on the outwardly side. Some of the stuff I talked about er earlier is on the community aspect of it. 
internal to the community, but through Project RISE and through the beliefs that you can see from how we have worked to help each other, we want to make sure that we're there for the broader community as well. So, uh, you know, various initiatives uh, focusing on the climate crisis, on hunger, on education, women's empowerment, access to healthcare, water and sanitation. You know, I can think of a lot of different efforts through cleanliness, trash pickup days, taking plastics out of the oceans, you know, save the sparrows initiatives. There's a lot of different initiatives as part of Project RISE that come around um, and all the communities strive to find different ways to give back and make sure that our, uh, you know, beliefs are being upheld. And another kind of uh, accomplishment, this was inaugurated back in 2005, but I believe has existed since the 1950s, is the Safety Hospital. Um, and this is just one hospital, but there's a bunch of hospitals in various different places. I know in Karachi and a lot of other uh, places where we have a lot of population in the Dawati Boras, we have built hospitals, but this one is also existing in Mumbai. All right, so I'll now jump down to uh, discussing misconceptions. So from a misconception side, uh, you know, one of the things that always comes up is we're often referred to as Boris, uh, which, you know, I think historically probably had, you know, some genesis to it, but the correct way to refer to us would be Dawadi Bora uh, because of kind of what I led with earlier, the, you know, where our lineage comes from, some Sena Dawood, and then Bora being the word for a trader or businessman, whereas Boris can have other meanings as well. So. Uh, and, and also it's more specific, there's many different types of boras as well uh, through the various sects that have happened over time. Another kind of important aspect, uh, you know, is you might see a Dawadi Bora kind of being their fast early or celebrating Eid early or, you know, the timing can be a little bit off sometimes. And it's because we follow a set calendar uh, based on astronomical calculations through, you know, the guidance that we've heard and learned from our Imams and our Dais. So the results, uh, you know, sometimes in occasional variances between a day or two forward or backwards between the start of the month and the end of the month as well. Um, and uh, another misconception, I mean, there could be obviously many, and I kind of try to synthesize it down to a few, is our belief in the seven pillars of Islam. Uh, you know, it's very similar to the five pillars as our uh, Sunni brothers and sisters and others believe in. Uh, but a key aspect of that is walaya. Walayat is, uh, you know, the love of Ahlul Bayt, the love of Rasulullah, so the love of Ahlul Bayt, love the love of Ali, the love of the Imams, and then the love of the Dai of our time as well, when the Imam is in seclusion. And then uh, the other five are pretty much, uh, you know, I would say other pretty much the same, but we also have Taharat, which is, uh, you know, really what you would call is wudu, but overall bodily Taharat, right? Um, as an important aspect. So we kind of raised that, it has been raised to a pillar of Islam. And then you have Soam Had Jihad um, and uh, what am I missing? Zakat, Salat, Zakat and Salat, obviously as well. All right. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the Austin Jamaat. Uh, so as I mentioned, we live in uh, different Places in the US, there's over 30, in the North America, there's about 35 different Jamaats in all the major cities and some smaller ones as well. Um, in Austin, we have about 85 uh, or more Dao Dibora families and several students at UT Austin as well. Uh, the current community center is located in Pflugerville. That was inaugurated back in 2008. You know, uh, obviously, over the last five, seven years, you've seen tremendous growth in Austin. And we've felt that same in our community as well as folks live for different places to live. Uh, we're existing with many young families. Yeah, there's a lot of kids around, which is always really nice at our markets, at our, at our uh, community center. Um, we're all professionals or small business owners, and uh, we try our best to be involved with the uh, you know, various needs of the local community with NGOs, government, and our neighbors as well. Uh, to kind of highlight some of that, uh, we've done a few different community outreaches. We do park cleanups with some of our churches that are next door. So our current property uh, where the Marcas is, we have a church there. We work closely with them, but then we've also, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. We have acquired a place we want to build a masjid. So there's a church there as well. We've you know worked with them on uh, doing some park cleanups and some of the trails around there. Uh, we focus on sustainability, women's empowerment, a lot of the businesses that are held by uh, the women of our community uh, and making sure everyone gets the, you know, the picture it is, get, get the voting out. So 
uh, we try to make sure that we're there and able to help out as part of that process. Uh, during COVID, obviously, that was a uh, difficult times for all. We made sure we were able to give back to the community in various ways. We were giving out masks, sewing some masks, um, and helping the different uh, areas around. And we actually have a lot of healthcare workers within us as well. Um, so various types of outreach was done around that time to make sure that some of them were actually involved in uh, the research of the COVID vaccine, some were involved in administering the COVID vaccine and you know, just making sure that everyone remains healthy. Uh, we've done our best to kind of be involved with our local government. As you mentioned, we believe that's a very important aspect of it. You'll notice that at all levels, all the way up to El Dalai Mutlaq, Sayyidina Mosul Saifuddin will be meeting with you know, heads of states of all countries. Um, and at the local level, we try to do that as well to you know, make sure that if there's any need that we can be helping with and on the, just like the series here, making sure that they also understand who we are as well. So uh, whether it be going to Capitol, being here in Austin, visiting with various representatives uh, and governors. And then finally, um, all right, I have one more. The measure that I mentioned earlier. So uh, it's exciting news for us. There's something that's obviously very much a focal point for for a community today is uh, we acquired land in 2020 uh, for to build a masjid. We've begun the architectural design uh, that they're in progress. So you can see some early renderings of that. Uh, we're looking forward to establishing not only the uh, Fatimi architectural components of a masjid that I mentioned earlier, but also combining it with some of the local architecture as well. So really looking forward to <clears throat> that becoming a reality uh, over the next few years. Uh, it is uh, it's funded by the community within itself, and this is something that's very near and dear to us. And I want to invite you all to uh, take this opportunity to say, please, once the masjid is there, and even today, do come visit us uh, at our community center. We'd love to meet up with you uh, wherever possible and uh, you know, join hands in helping the broader Umba as well as uh, the broader communities that we live in. So thank you again, uh, you know, Chaplain Sama. I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of the uh, information about Dawa de Boris and about us here in Austin. Absolutely. Jazakallah the, the honor is kind of all ours for that. And we really appreciate you um, for being able to, in such a uh, concise way, I don't know how you did it with, with respect to, you know, almost, you know, 2000 years, 1400 years of Islamic history there to put then such a beautiful PowerPoint. I really appreciate that. And um, just showcasing, I think some of the uh, the, the, not just the, the work, but the continuing ongoing mission as well. Um, just how, uh, uh our Daudi Bora, uh, brothers and sisters practice their faith and, and it calls them into a space to be involved in their communities with each other. Um, so many different ways. I appreciate you sharing. It was really beautiful to see. And, um, I, we've got uh, a number of things that had come up, uh, as questions. And so inshallah, uh, just as a reminder for, uh, folks uh, to please put the uh, questions that you have. Uh, you can put them in the chat. You can message them to myself uh, and we can go from there. Uh, but the uh, first question that had come up here was with respect to a question about uh, how the Daudi Bora community is generally kind of organized. You did mention that there's uh, a dial look at the top of uh, kind of maybe if we see a structure per se. Um, is there kind of, uh, if we were to kind of illustrate it in a sense, um, what, what does it maybe uh, look like conceptually? Because from what we're seeing, you know, it looks like you are very well organized in a sense. Uh, very well organized is something that I would say the Muslim community is maybe not the best at know, uh, to be known as it's in that aspect, but from the top to the aspects of communal social welfare to the, uh, you know, a way that you are, um, Kind of present into the needs of the community around the uh, society that's all there top to bottom um there's a very kind of uh, strong indication of kind of structure that's that shows that y'all are on the same page whether you are here in austin or in houston or in different spaces so i'm curious if you'd be able to shed a little bit of insight to what the structure looks like within the daudi bora uh, community yeah of course uh and alhamdulillah it is it is a blessing uh in many ways that structure obviously gives us a lot of opportunities, a lot of support, a lot of ability to do all the things that are important to us in our faith and our daily lives. Um, I, I think the easiest way to kind of describe it is 
it kind of centers uh, all the way up at the top of the imam and during the seclusion of the imam and al mutlaq so i'll talk about today it's because given the imam is in seclusion obviously he's at the you know top of that kind of structure right and then his office uh which is based off of in mumbai but obviously has uh, various headquarters in the different regions um exist for administrative purposes and then a leader similar to an imam in a masjid uh we have an amr sahib in a jamaat so an amr sahib who's the president of the board of directors is uh kind of sent to convey that mission and uh, to continue that mission at the local level so that happens kind of at a um not a religious level only but a secular level as well so you know it is a very important aspect for us uh, in that sense uh to kind of work together and kind of therefore be able to achieve that central authorities uh which is Al-Dai al vision and dream um to continue to progress forward definitely thank you so much for sharing uh on that, that that's very helpful to to know and um another question we have here i think uh, if if you would be able to uh are able to explain the uh, and clarify on the seven pillars of Islam. Uh, I know you mentioned there's uh, in which include you know like the generally kind of understood within Sunni Islam five pillars. There's also additional ones of like uh, tahara or wilayat. Um, if you, uh, I think the question here has, um, could you explain the seven pillars of Islam? Are these from Allah or the Prophet? As are the five pillars, or are they uh, maybe different in in that aspect? Uh, if you don't mind clarifying that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so I mean, of course, I think everything ties back to the Prophet and Allah and His Word, which is the Quran, right? Um, and the, as we kind of mentioned, the final interpreter of that is the Imam or the Aldai. So the uh, the reference to the seven um, the seven pillars of Islam, uh, there's many texts that have been obviously written. Uh, I think if you look back to the Fatimid era, there is a Sayyidina al Qadi al Nu'man. Uh, there's a, he was a huge he was a he was a qadi, he was a, you know, a judge. Uh, he was the highest judge. And then also he was uh, a scholar as well in that sense. So he'd written many books as well. So it's mentioned in his book uh, in more detail, the seven pillars. Uh, and he cites the imams and before him, the lineage of where that comes from. Um, the seven pillars as walaya, that's the top one. Um, and that is, uh, you know, very, I guess the translation would be love. Um, and the following of the leader, right? So whether it be the imam or da'i in seclusion, uh, when the imam's in seclusion, it's the walayat of that leader, and through him and following the succession all the way back to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Allah Ta'ala, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's uh, how walayat works. The hara we talked about, um, which is really, you know, it, it is the... Uh, Purity in many ways of your soul and your body. Um, so that's what, you know, in kind of a really synthesizing it down, there's probably hours of discourse that can be had on each of these topics uh, for sure, but um, I'll do my best. And to be very frank and honest at the same time, I think it's important as we talk about some of the specifics of religion is I don't deem myself a scholar. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people that have a lot more knowledge than I do. So I'll do my best to kind of convey that. Um, then there's Salat. The five prayers, zakat, which is the zakat that we give, uh, the psalms, uh, psalm, which is uh, the rosas that we do, the fasting that we do during Ramadan. Um, and then more specifically, as we kind of mentioned about the misconceptions earlier, is do you, because a calendar is set, we'll always have 30 days of fasting um, during Ramadan. Um, so the psalm, hajj is obviously uh, pilgrimage to Mecca, to the Holy Kaaba, um, at least once in your lifetime, if you can afford it, and then jihad, uh, which can be external or internal, right? And actually, we believe that the uh, the harder jihad is the internal jihad. So uh, that is something, if I was to synthesize it down, that's the seven pillars. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we have another question here um, that uh, it says, you know, thank you for the good good presentation and for for sharing the informative thoughts. Uh, it's really helped, it's quite helpful. Um, I I think I heard mentioned that uh, I believe from the presentation here that the leader of the Daudi Boras is sinless. Is that correct, or was it uh, as mis misunderstand? Uh, and if so, does that mean that the leader of the Daudi Boras is uh, has some degree of divinity or is divine? 
And if so, what are the implications of that divinity from a belief standpoint? Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. So uh, I think as we kind of follow that same process down, right? We have Prophet Muhammad, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Imams, and then al Dai. So uh, as part of that same process, you would say that um, what I was referring to was the Imam, and then in the seclusion of the Imam, al Dai al Mutlaq. Uh, we have to be kind of careful because the Dai's, that term can be used as a missionary during various times. Uh, but in the aspect that we're talking about today, yes, al Dai al Mutlaq. Uh, the Imam, because he is he's the sole representative of the Imam with the full authority of the Imam, is having the attributes of that similar aspect to it as well. Um, in terms of implications, um, I don't, I mean, for us, it's very simple. <laughs> uh, you know, that's why we follow the teachings uh, of the Da'i and the Imams. Um, and, and that, I mean, there's, there's a lot of theoretical, uh, you know, discussion behind this, not necessarily able to, uh, you know, again, like I said, I'm not a scholar able to speak to in detail about it with much ability, but um, that's kind of the aspect of how that follows. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for sharing that. And I think a similar question that come in um, just off of that aspect in terms of uh, the person of the Da'il uh, al-Mutlaq, is there a, um, similar to in other uh, religious traditions, how uh, the religious leader is chosen in the community or appointed or how that succession does occur. Um, and so if you could sh uh, share a little bit about that as well. Yeah, no, great, great. Thank you for that question. Uh, it, it's actually, again, it's simple, but obviously in practice, that's where a lot of the differences come from in the various sects. But the process is nas, right? Nas is uh, going from, in, in the case of Imam, our belief is it's father to son. So in the lineage of Imam Hussein coming down, the descendants, it's father after son, after father after son, and that continues on even in seclusion. Um, in al Dai al-Mutlaq, the concept of Nas exists, but not uh, restricted to being father to son. So each leader, each Dai, before he passes, chooses a successor and appoints a successor. Um, and there's a process to that, but uh, that's... That's how that works. So it's very much that divinity concept. And again, going back to, like you mentioned, it is a similar question to clarifying that aspect. Um, that divinity comes from the, you know, the Dai being connected to the Imam spiritually and that ability to then be able to appoint a successor through that spirituality. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, this other question came in and you may have... Uh won somebody over with the food or the community aspect uh, but they are uh they asked uh you know we we heard in a previous session that in order to you know join uh like other communities i think for example like in the ahmadiyya you know apart from the shahada there's like a the concept of baya um or uh you know giving uh this um th this bait uh essentially to the caliph at the time to the uh to the to the founder as well and so uh in in essence uh for if somebody was to want to join the daudi bora uh community um or kind of you know convert into that community what what does that look like um uh and specifically here in austin has that been something as well that for the community uh if that's been something that's also occurred but curious about the process of what that would look like yeah i mean first and foremost ahamu sahla to everyone welcome uh, you know, uh, just to come meet us, talk to us, sit with us, eat with us. But obviously, if someone is looking to join the Dawah Dibora specifically, uh, similar to, I mean, I don't want to say similar because that word kind of, you know, has certain meanings. But uh, as you kind of mentioned, that concept of giving a bite, um, there's a concept of mithak. I think their words are similar or they have similar definitions, but we use the term mithak. Um, and that that means that. Right, give, giving bed or giving, uh, uh, you know, basically confirming that you believe in the religion, believe in the leaders, um, and mainly it's you know following that whole path back all the way back to uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So I think that's that's an important aspect. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, as we talked about earlier, we believe the Imams are the direct descendants. So because of that aspect, that lineage is very critical to the whole process uh, and our belief structure. 
Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, the other question that came in here uh, was res with respect to the Libas al Anwar um, and asking uh, Is the Libas al Anwar is this, uh, something that um, Daudi Boras wear, um, you know, whether in not just religious settings, but in secular settings of home? I know we saw the pictures and, and everything of, of kind of going out and serving, um, but uh, is, is in terms of from a faith perspective, is it understood that these are kind of like the libas that you wear here? Is the libas you wear um, at home? Is the libas that you wear outside in, in the masjid, anywhere like that? Or um, does that uh, does that have different connotations depending on the space that you occupy? Yeah, no, certainly. So we certainly aspire uh, to do more and more of it. I think everyone follows it to their own degree for sure. But um, the clothing is definitely set up in a way that you can use it and wear it in your daily lives. So you'll often see men wearing the skull cap at least. Uh, many will also wear the clothing, but at least wearing the topi. Um, and you'll see many women wearing the rida uh, as part of their daily lives. And obviously at, at our mosque as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I think you had alluded to this uh, in a sense when you gave your 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 welcome and your ahlan wasalan, um, but tangibly in terms of uh, going to, um, you know, uh, to the Daudi uh, Bora uh, community or to the mosque to kind of come in. Uh, some other uh, communities maybe exercise forms of security or forms of caution in terms of who they do allow into the sacred spaces. Um, I'm curious as well, is that something within uh, the Daudi Bora community? Is it pretty much open door or is it in a sense, if someone wants to come visit, uh, there's certain kind of uh, precautions or steps that they take before kind of coming? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the doors are always open. Uh, for us to better meet kind of with you and give you, you know, time as you're coming to visit us, it's nice if we know you're coming, but you're always welcome. <laughs> that's the best way to put it. The doors are always open. Absolutely. But uh, I think uh, as I, I should actually flip to this because that might help. Yeah, no um, and the last slide, and I am looking at uh, Varika being here, Sister Varika, who you know leads a lot of our public relations efforts, and she does an amazing job. Uh, she had helped me a lot with this presentation, so I can't take much credit for it. <laughs> uh, but uh, the let me share this. So um, we do have a website where it's easy for anyone. Uh, whether it be from the Muslim communities or outside uh, to get in touch with us. So, you know, whether it be by going to the website here, uh, we do have a link there, we have an email uh, that you can connect with, um, and whether it be Sister Mubarakah or myself or anyone else in the community, we'll be happy to make sure that you're well looked after. Uh, but if you have a day and you're looking to just come by, you're feel free and welcome to. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, we'll definitely, um, I'll touch base with you as well afterwards for, for the slides. They're, they're great slides, by the way. So Sister Mubarak and Zakla for the design of the slides. Uh, we'll, you may see them out elsewhere in a Muslim space program, but uh, no copyright infringement, inshallah. Um, curious about uh, the, uh, you, you mentioned the question to come in uh, about um, the concept of the the masjid within the Daudi Bar community. Um, we know that uh, in, in, uh, in Nizar Ismaili or Ismaili communities as well, it's uh, you know we're often referred to as Jamaat Khana. Um, in other places, you know, Masjid Masallah. I know you mentioned like Markas. Uh, I'm curious within the Daudi Bar community when referring to uh, the place of worship, the mosque, the, uh, the Markas, or so. Um, what oftentimes is kind of like the main term that's used? And yeah, excellent question. And you know, the Nizari Ismailis are from a lineage perspective very close to us. So I, I can see a lot of, you know, you'll see some places where there's similarities, but this is probably one of the places where you do differ. Uh, so we, we do very much call it a masjid. Uh, but if it's not the, you know, you know, well, masjid, we try to hold to a very specific uh, level of respect uh, due to the way it's designed and its function. Uh, some of the smaller communities will often have a markas. So like for us today, we would call our community center of Marcas because I would, I would say it's not elevated to the level of a masjid just yet, right? Uh, obviously, from a basic definition of masjid, it's anywhere you give sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so you can define it any way you want, but from a lingual perspective, how we define and use it, we say as a market as a community center versus a masjid is a very specific place. And often, you know, the Imam or Al-Dai will have also visited that place as well, um, to typically to inaugurate it. Um, and uh, I think, you know, was that the entire question? Was there a second part to that? I might have missed. 
No, it was, it was just that I think the other part that uh, that was there was um, at, you you had kind of explained it in the sense of the any kind of significance that that yeah. those had, right. had layered it there. But I think it just reminds you to just a higher level and a you know much more dedicated structure. Uh, a community center is just a, I mean, because oftentimes markets can exist in various different aspects, right? We have a standalone structure, someone may not. So again, we, we don't define those as budgets. Budgets for us is a very specific structure that is meant for that. Uh, but to kind of, I think, round that discussion out, I would say our budgets today are built with the very specific needs in mind, right? So a lot of the stuff that we talked about that our communities gets involved in, um, so the main masjid, you know, the place for Salah, the Beit Salah will be there for men and women. Um, is designed that way, but then there's also often attached structures to it, like the madrasa or, or the community kitchen, where we will always have meals after our uh, various services and prayers. Um, and also for the Faisal Mawad al Burhania, a lot of the preparation will be done there. So the masjids today often exist with multiple, you know, different structures as part of that entire uh, project or that entire space. Yeah, definitely, and uh, and thank you, Sister Mubarakah, for sharing the the email uh, there. Inshallah, we'll also add it to the to recap um, when we send out. Uh, inshallah, and um, to, to you, you're referring uh, Brother Murtaza as well. Um, this aspect of Salah was there was a question on that. Um, we know within Sunni and Shia Islam, there is slight differences within the Salah of how the Salah is performed. Um, and curious about uh, what does the Salah look like within the Daudi Bora um, tradition? If you're able to give a kind of brief overview of that. Yeah, uh, I would say it's it's obviously very similar. A lot a lot of the things uh, to probably a bystander you probably wouldn't be able to tell too much of a difference. Some of the key things that may stand out um, and that we can probably easily tell um, is when and I think I heard uh, the respected Sheikh who you had earlier from the Smasher Shia group talk a little bit about that. So a lot of those apply. Um, so where we will have the men will have their hands down rather than uh, on their waist. Um, we'll typically have our legs closer together rather than separated. Um, outside of that, I would say pretty much everything else probably looks similar. Uh, we'll we'll wear we'll you know the men will always don a topi or you know the skull cap when praying. Um, that's something as part of just respect we we often do. Um, and I'm trying to think of if there's any other really distinct differences, uh, but I would say from my understanding, I think those are pretty much kind of the really big ones. Um, and I think this, I'm guessing this question's coming and maybe if not, I'll add to it is uh, similar to, I think the question that was asked to, um, to the Sheikh from the Spanish group, I'm sorry, I forgot his name, but he did a great job. He was an excellent speaker, by the way. Um, he, he explained the fact about there being the five Salah, but often they can be combined in different times. Um, so, you know, sometimes the whole Asa will be combined or Maghrib and Isha. There's still two separate prayers, uh, just the timings are closer together rather than completely separated. Yeah, that's really that's really helpful um, to know. And uh, I believe that was uh, our first session with uh, Sheikh Jafar uh, Mohibullah of uh, Islamic al yeah. so Austin. Um, awesome. Uh, I think we've uh, we've got just a couple questions here, but if anybody has any final questions, please, you can just put it in the chat message and um, we'll be able to wrap up here very shortly. But uh, one question that had come in here referred to, I'm glad they, that it was mentioned um, and that you brought it up, was uh, in terms of the uh, the label that oftentimes gets put on the Dawoodi Bora community, you know, from folks who are not within the community, oftentimes, as myself was guilty of, you know, saying like Bori Muslims or Bori Islam or whatnot, um, and that how and, and often it's from within the community too. Sometimes it's just, it's just one of the things that just happen to stick around. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and 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 kind of going off of that in a sense, we you know we see that other communities within within Islam also get you know certain labels because of certain associations. You have like uh, Arakhanis get called for uh, for folks who are Ismaili or Qadianis or uh, folks who are Ahmadi and so on and so forth. Um, and oftentimes these become normalized in a sense because you know at, at the root of them, you know, the, from our language linguistically, it's not a kind of a harmful yeah. thing, but in a sense it becomes like a pejorative. Um, I'm curious in that aspect to the dimension when you're talking about 
uh, that label of Bori, whether it, it does get called just within the community or even you know, referred outside, does it have that kind of connotation as well of being more in a sense of a pejorative or does it have uh, other uh, connotations beyond just like, oh, that's... Yeah. I, I would say it's not really hurtful. Like if someone calls you Bori, it's not like I take it to heart and it's an issue by any means. But I think uh, it's just a matter of getting the right information out, right? I think that term, if not just out there, is just wrong. So that would be Bora is the correct term. So just making sure that that linguistic aspect continues in its appropriate manner. And given it's an informational session, felt it was important to kind of highlight that. Yeah, and definitely I appreciate you highlighting that. Um, uh, the, the question that comes up here is, is on the aspect of misconceptions, but it, it says that um, beyond what you've kind of listed in, 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 the, in the slideshow here, for you as a Daudi Bora Muslim, you know, uh, who's who you know lives here and has lived in society, has you know interacted probably with other Muslims, other people. What would you say is practically some of the biggest or uh, you know some of the more manifested misconceptions that you have either heard or been privy to about Daudi Bora Muslims in general, beyond maybe what has been shared in the uh, the presentation here, just in the lived experience. Yeah, I think thanks for the question. I'm trying to give it a little bit of thought because um, it, it took me a while to come up with the misconceptions by itself. <laughs> uh, to be very frank, uh, I, I would say Alhamdulillah, we're, we've been very blessed in many ways. Uh, I think going back to probably a very original question, the first one, because of our centralized authority, a lot of things are actually very commonly understood. So to find things that are misunderstood sometimes is not as easy. Which, which is a huge blessing to us, alhamdulillah, right? Um, but I, I guess like one of the thoughts would be is because of the way we dress, the way we look, a lot of us will actually have a beard, right? Um, and we, we uh, a lot of us will practice to not even trim the beard and keep, keep it in full. Um, you know, we'll, we'll often get looked at as very, very conservative. And I would say, yes, we're conservative in our faith, but we're very progressive in our beliefs and our actions, right? So we're, we kind of find that balance between the times and you'll, you'll see that in a lot of our different, you know, things that we get involved in, we're very much involved um, in kind of applying our faith from its very earnest kind of understanding and from its very, uh, you know, very meaningful beginnings to its applicability for today. And a lot of that is possible due to say the Muslim Safe Udin today and all the leaders before him. Definitely. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I think we've got two last questions here that came in, inshallah, and uh, uh, we'll, we can close with that. Um, the first question that comes in here is, for for you um, as a Daudi Bora uh, Muslim, what do you feel is the biggest challenge, um, not just maybe for you, uh, but for the community as well um, on the whole, uh, in, in not maybe just uh, in this country, but just across the board, what do you feel is maybe the biggest challenges that you've seen or experienced or maybe have in mind uh, that the Daudi Bora Muslim community and Daudi Bora Muslims uh, experience? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer in two ways. And this is this is just me. This is not on behalf of the community. I'll just kind of share my own thoughts. Um, first, I would say is we're a smaller community. Like I mentioned, we're about a million. I think if you look at a lot of the various other sects, they have a lot more population. So I think with, with size comes some challenges as well. But again, Alhamdulillah, I feel like we've been able to organize ourselves and do it the best we can to do the most we can, right? Um, and I think that goes to my second point is that wish and hope that we could do even more, right? So the challenge is how can we be uh, further effective in the societies we live in, further effective with the Muslim brothers and sisters uh, and everyone else as part of society that we live together. And so um, I think it's a challenge, but it's really more of a goal. <laughs> uh, it's something that we look to always make sure that uh, we can continue to do better in that aspect. Absolutely. And, and this may segue into this, this last question here. Um, beyond what you've shared here, what do you feel is if you could give one takeaway for people who are attending, who are listening, inshallah, in the future or uh, beyond, um, one takeaway that people can or should know about Daudi Bora Muslims and the, the Daudi Bora community, um, what, what do you feel that that would be? Yeah, I think it's pretty simple in a way. Uh, I think it's it's just really just give them a feel safe with being, right? Uh, his holiness, if you look at him, his practices, his teachings, um, 
his actions. And one of the things I think we kind of touched on earlier is we we're very much into the al and the amal that comes with it. So it's the ilm, the seeking of knowledge, but in the amal is part of the pillars of Islam and our actions that come that follow within it. Um, that's something that I would say is kind of essence of it all, right? So I, actually probably in this, because of limitation of time and information, I probably yeah, I could have spent hours just talking about what His Holiness has achieved, all of his teachings um, and all that, but it's been synthesized down. So I would, I would definitely encourage you to go do more research and uh, learn a little bit more about him and all the leaders before him. Definitely. And, and inshallah, the, the links and the, the QR codes are provided there. And uh, the contact information, again, has been put in the chat generously. Um, I have one personal question, and we'll close it out on this, inshallah. You did show food. Um, I'm curious about what is what does the dessert scene look like at a Daudi Bora Muslim? This, this has to be uh, probably the best answer you might get today. Dessert actually is the thing we start off with, <laughs> and that's part of our tradition. So, well, you yeah, said <laughs> compared to where you might see dessert being last, we we kick it, we kick the meal off. Actually, I'll, I'll be a little more clear. We kick the meal off with uh, with a small pinch of salt. Uh, we said Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Obviously, remember Allah before we start. Uh, you know the meal. And then we jump right into dessert. So uh, if, you, if you look at the tile that I talked about, uh, the dessert scene is excellent. I would say just like the you know traditions and everything else we talked about, it does obviously bring in a lot of the cultures that we're a part of. So if you look back to you know, the 1400 years of history here, you'll see all the different desserts being carried through. Um, well, I'll definitely look forward to it. And my email is being drafted up right now for... <laughs> That, that's there. So inshallah, we'll definitely uh, encourage everybody um, to not just uh, stop the conversation here, um, but to continue this conversation and to be able to uh, get to know our brothers and sisters in the Daudi Bora community better and uh, all others inside Austin. But uh, Brother uh, Murtaza and uh, Brother Asis Mubarakha from for the slide credits as well, uh, really, really appreciate um, the work and the effort that y'all put in um, to uh, be with us, uh, to spend your evening with us here, and to give us uh, such a beautiful insight into a very beautiful community and a very beautiful tradition and culture uh, that is within the Daudi Bora community. And um, from uh, Muslim space and for all other individuals here, present, not present, uh, we extend that uh, sincerely to you also thank you for being here and for everybody here inshallah uh, we will continue our inside islam uh, series uh, going forward uh, every uh, final wednesday of the month we'll have uh, our inside islam i believe our next one if not the one after we'll have uh ismaili uh, uh nizari ismaili um uh, shiism as well as the nation of islam and a few others that will come along but uh between now and then inshallah before uh things get hard we will definitely touch base with uh, you, Brother Murtazad, we will pay a visit there. But uh, from our, yeah. we appreciate you being here. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and it was a and very, it was an honor to be here and thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. And a slight correction for me, uh, Sister Zainab had uh, pointed out, it's actually going to be the uh, Lahore Ahmadiyya uh, Muslim community that will be next. So we will we will get in time in, in, in due time. But uh, Please enjoy the rest of your night. The recording for the session will be up shortly. And again, uh, Brother Murtaza, Sister Mubarakah, we'll see you all very shortly soon. Assalamu alaikum. Zakla for being here. Assalamu alaikum.